Hello and welcome to the Welcome Bible Study Leader's Guide for February 2021 for our study from Gather Magazine, the magazine of the women of the ELCA. I'm Dave Thomas, lead pastor of Cross of Christ Lutheran Church. And for our Welka Bible Study leaders, for our Welka Study Circle members, for anyone joining us today, welcome. We're glad to share this time together. This is the second of a four-part series on angels. And after last month's introduction, this month we hear about turnaround angels. As our author puts it in our study, these are messengers who bring to folks messages from God to change course. So we will be beginning in our study on page 36 of your magazine. So please grab your Gather magazine and your Bible and your note-taking supplies. And when you're ready, we'll jump right in. After the introduction on page 37, in the first column, uh, we get a reference to uh, a Greek word that's fairly well known. It's the, the word metanoia, and it is usually translated as our Bible study author puts it, uh, as repentance, to change one's mind. It has an, an implication, an intonation. Uh, it has a connotation. Um, not only changing one's mind, but based on a change of mind, having a change of behavior. It, uh, it uh, literally means to, uh, to do an about face, uh, to head in a different direction. So uh, that is uh, the kind of angelic messages we're going to look at. And the first is from Luke uh, 15. These are verses 8 through 10. And this is a part of a series of lost and found parables that Jesus tells. One is about a lost coin. Uh, that's this one. There's another one that comes before it about lost sheep or a lost a single sheep. And then afterwards, a lost son or a prodigal son. Now, all of these lost and found parables follow a similar pattern. Something is lost. Um, you will notice that uh, what is lost is, is one of a collection. One sheep from a flock of 100 one coin from a, a, a bank, a collection, a holding of ten, and one of two sons. As the parables progress, there are fewer and fewer uh, in, the, in the greater collection, making each lost thing even more precious. When uh, it is discovered that if something is lost, someone goes looking for that lost thing, or someone is waiting for the return of the lost person, in this case, the prodigal son. And there is significant cost in this, either the shepherd leaving uh, the 99 behind or the woman frantically turning her house upside down and inside out or this fretting parent uh, waiting for the hoped return of, of the lost child. Uh, the parables conclude with the lost being found or uh, finding their way back, in the case of the prodigal son. And then there is much um, celebration. There is uh, extravagant rejoicing. One could say there is a prodigal uh, jubilation, which is shared with others. So here we go. Let's jump into this first um, referenced text. This is on page 37 of our Bible study. It's Luke 15, beginning at verse 8. Jesus is continuing his teachings in parables. And he says, or, uh, adding to the, Lost parable, uh, lost sheep parable, or what woman having ten silver coins? Um, the silver coin in reference here is a drachma. This is Jewish currency. It literally means what could be held in one's hands. It, it uh, came to apply to the weight that could be held, uh, an amount that could be held in, in one ha one's hand, but uh, eventually was represented with coinage. Well, a drachma was uh, a Jewish coin paid for a day of common labor. It's roughly then equivalent to the Roman coin, the denarius. So what woman having 10 silver drachma, not sure what the plural of that is, drachmas, 10 silver coins, if she loses one, then does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she, when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me. Rejoice with me translates a single Greek word. It's a compound word uh, of uh, 
with or together and experiencing joy. Uh, experiencing joy together is one Greek word we translate it here. Rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I had lost. Verse 10, just so, Jesus goes on and says, I tell you there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. One out of what? Billions and billions and billions of sinners, right? So um, I like the question on uh, column two uh, about writing down or maybe sharing in conversation something of value that you have lost that you later found. And what actions did you take in searching or waiting for that lost item to be found? And then I would add, uh, to whom did you share, with whom did you share this good news of the lost being found? And uh, did you celebrate? All right, the next uh, text is on page 38. Uh, and this is uh, our text from Genesis chapter 3. Um, and it is the story of God driving Adam and Eve out of the garden after the original sin, after their fall. Um, and so here we go. Verse... Uh, Let's see, sorry about that. Verses, oh, just a single verse, 24. It says, he, that is God, drove out um, the man, Adam. The same word in Hebrew for driving out can mean, um, depending on context, to banish. That would be a good translation here. It can also mean to divorce. So God drove out Adam, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, east of Eden, he placed a cherubim. Uh, we talked about this last month. Uh, literally, a cherubim means uh, a flaming one or one on fire. And a sword flaming uh, and turning, flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. So these, these two are, are set uh, as guardians, uh, a cherubim, a flaming one, and a, a, a sword of fire, a flaming sword. So we saw, responding to the sin, or sins really, uh, one incident, many motives of Adam and Eve. Disobedience, disobedience, lack of trust, wanting to be like God. God banishes them from the garden and places east of Eden these two flaming guardians. Question from uh, the study is who, that is what angels, the writer asks, um, I suppose uh, based on this question, some would debate whether these are angels or not, but who is guarding in the... Uh, creation today? Who are guardians of the environment? What angels are turning aside those who would pillage and plunder? Um, so you might want to bring that up in your circle conversations. I might suggest another um, question as well. Why does God even need to protect creation from humans? I mean, aren't we called, just previously recorded in Genesis, aren't we called to be stewards of creation? Aren't we supposed to be the protectors? Why does creation need to be protected from us? Well, same kind of sins, right? Disobedience, selfishness, wanting to be like God, uh, short-sightedness, all of those things, greed. All right, that's our, our story there. The next is the story of Jacob. It's actually one of two angel stories in Jacob's life that we will uh, take a look at in this study. This first is from Genesis 28. Uh, Bible study gives us some background here. Jacob is one of two sons of Isaac and Rebekah. He's the younger son. His older brother's name is Esau. Now Esau was dad's favorite. Uh, he was a hunter. He made uh, apparently an awesome meat stew. I don't know. Wild boar? Venison? Don't know, but the Bible tells us that uh, Isaac loved um, Esau because he loved this stew. Well, he loved Esau for lots of reasons, but that was a good one. Uh, and because, you know, Esau was a manly man, very macho. Uh, he was uh, big and strong and hairy and uh, a man of the out of doors. And uh, that uh, caught his father's favor. Jacob, on the other side, uh, was a kind of um, mama's boy for sure. Uh, hung out with his mom. Um, had a very different personality and temperament. And so there was quite the sibling rivalry, uh, quite a split in the family here. Now, Jacob, uh, we are told, fools his dying father uh, into thinking that he is 
Esau, and he steals his brother's uh, birthright as the firstborn. Uh, as our writer puts it, he tricks dad into essentially changing his will in his dying moments. So Natch, um, Esau's um, not happy about this. He's uh, quite put out when he figures it out. And so Jacob has to flee. His mother uh, sends him away uh, to distant relatives. Uh, distant in both meanings, right? Uh, a long way away and, you know, cousins uh, that you can hide out with for a while. Uh, now, um, it's clear Jacob isn't sorry for what he did. He's not going to give back the birthright. Uh, but he also does not want to get pummeled um, or to try to make things right. So he runs away. So into this context, we get the story of Jacob's ladder. Uh, and um, I'm going to deal with the, the verses here, the, the story as a whole. It's broken up into parts in our, in our Bible study, but I think this will give you plenty of background. This is Genesis 28. We begin at verse 10. Now, Jacob left Beersheba. Uh, Beersheba is in the Negev Desert in uh, southern Israel. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, its name means uh, well of oaths, uh, a, 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 a water well. Uh, well. You know, you dig a well. Uh, well of oath. Uh, beer, well, and Sheba, oath. It's the site where both uh, Abraham the grandfather, and Isaac, the father, make treaties. They make oaths with neighboring kings. They're called kings in the Bible, and they're kind of more so like um, tribal leaders, leaders of very small kingdoms or bands. Uh, and uh, they come to some agreements over land use and water rights and non-aggression agreements. They make oaths there at the well. So that's where it gets its name. So uh, Jacob leads Beersheba, and he heads towards uh, Haran. From whence his grandfather Abraham, or back then Abram, had journeyed. Uh, he uh, was living there uh, when he was called by God uh, to come to a, a land of promise. And uh, in faith he follows. Uh, Haran is in um, today what we uh, would know as southern Turkey. So it's north of uh, Canaan and it's quite a, quite a journey away. So this is... This is the trip, this is the journey that Jacob has taken. Verse 11, he came to a certain place and there he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And I made a note, no wonder he has such weird dreams. He uses a rock for a pillow, but there we are. Verse 12, and he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord, that is uh, Yahweh, when we see in English uh, in the Old Testament, uh, L-O-R-D in all caps, even if the O-R indeed are smaller letters but still in caps, it is the uh, a replacement for the tetragrammaton, uh, the four letter, four consonants in the personal name of God, which we usually transliterate into English as Y-H-W-H and most often pronounced as Yahweh. So verse 13, and Yahweh stood beside him and said, I am Yahweh, the God of your, of Abraham, your father. Okay, technically Abraham is um, Jacob's grandfather, but he means your, 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 your uh, ancestor. And the God of Isaac, your actual father. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Verse 14, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. He is, God is repeating to Jacob the promises he made to Abraham. Uh, this will be your land. Your descendants will be countless. Uh, you are called not only to be blessed, but to be a blessing to all peoples. Uh, this is the repeating of the, the, uh, the covenant God made with Abraham. Verse 15. Know that I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So why is Jacob receiving this promise? Well, it's obviously not based on merit. Jacob hasn't done anything to earn this promise. It's not based on morals or ethics, right? Jacob is a conniver. Um, he is a, a bit of a scoundrel. He cheats his brother, and then he runs away. Uh, so why this promise made to Jacob? 
reiterated uh, to Jacob the promise of, of Abraham? Well, it's based on God's promise and God's promise keeping. God makes a promise to um, Jacob's ancestors, to, to Abraham and Sarah. And it is God's plan for his descendants and for all the families of the earth to continue to keep covenant. So Jacob stands in this line, and it is not uh, for any other reason than because God has made this promise. It is not because Jacob proves himself to be so worthy. Uh, we might say um, it is a grace promise, not a merit-based promise. Verse 16, then Jacob woke up from his dream and said, surely the Lord, surely Yahweh is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome, uh, we could translate that, how fearful. It could even be translated how dreadful in some circumstances. But here awesome is a, is a pretty good translation, literally in the sense of um, awestruck, uh, recognizing the nearness, the presence of the Holy One. Uh, Jacob is, uh, uh, notes the awesomeness of this place. This is none other than the house of God. In Hebrew, he says this. Well, okay, so I'm not going to translate here. There's not, in Hebrew, he says, Bethel, or Bethel, uh, as we'll soon see. This is the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose up early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and he set it up for a pillar, um, an altar, a monument, and he poured oil on the top of it. That is a sign of, of consecrating it as a holy marker, a uh, monument to this um, encounter with God. Verse 19, and he called the place Bethel. We usually say Bethel. Bethel would be uh, a more accurate pronunciation. Uh, but the name of the city was Lutz, or Lutz, at first. That is, Jacob renames this place that has been known as Lutz, which means um, almond tree in Hebrew. Uh, he renames it Bethel, house of God. So the town once known as almond tree is now known as house of God. Verse 20. Then Jacob makes a vow. Here again is uh, Sheba. Uh, he makes an oath, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give one-tenth to you. So there we go. Uh, that's that encounter, Jacob's ladder. Um, Back to the study on page 39, question 6 says this. Why was the ladder of angels a fearful experience to Jacob? Well, having kind of dug into it, we might say that, well, um, as we looked at last time, angels themselves are fearful in appearance. They are not the baby-faced, chubby creatures of Hallmark cards. Uh, that's why angels have to say to humans uh, when they encounter them, fear not. Um, but even more, the the image uh, of, of these angels ascending and descending on a ladder between heaven and earth in Jacob's dream uh, represented for him the presence of God. So it's fearful in that sense of fear of the Lord or, or reverence of God, uh, awesomeness of God. And question seven, it asks, what change uh, takes place in Jacob or starts to take place? What do you see happening to Jacob here? You might see other things. Uh, I would say a possibility is that Jacob is starting to get some perspective uh, and maybe um, a sense of humility that he seems to lack. All right, next uh, angel encounter for Jacob, this takes place some 20 years later, uh, is uh, another story of Jacob and a, a, an angel uh, or a heavenly being. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, uh, and a wrestling match, and how Jacob gets a new name, a uh, nickname, the name Israel. This is from Genesis 32. It's verses 6 through 8. The messengers, these are human messengers in this case, uh, who are bringing word to Jacob um, from his brother uh, Esau. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. That's an army. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and justifiably so. And he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies, thinking, if Esau comes to the one company and destroys it, then the company that is left will escape. 
And I have to say that is not a very upbeat or optimistic plan. The plan is basically let's divide ourselves in half and hope at least half of us escape death and doom. Uh, Jacob, understandably, is uh, very afraid of his brother Esau, especially since he's coming with 400 men and is uh, certain that bad things are about to happen. But God has another plan and another message for Jacob. And this is from Genesis 32, verses 22 to 31. All right, Genesis 32, 22 to 31. We are on page. We are on page 39 in uh, the Gather Magazine. So the same night he, that is Jacob, which by the way, in, in Hebrew, uh, it means one who surplants or takes the place of another. Good name for this guy. The same night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children. And I pause and say, there's plenty of material there for an entirely different study someday, right? Two wives, two maids, 11 children. But for now, we're on to a different topic. So let's just take this at face value and move on. So he takes his family and he crosses the ford of the Jabbok or Yabak. The Yabak River, um, its Hebrew name means crooked or bent, a windy river flows from the north uh, eventually into the Jordan River. Uh, and it uh, is uh, a long and flowing river that uh, one would encounter on a route from Haran to Canaan, as Jacob does here and as Abraham, his grandfather, had many years before and crossed at this point as well. So the Yabak River or Jabak. Verse 23. He took them and sent them across the stream that is his clan, his family, and likewise everything that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. At which point we should really say, what? Uh, what, what? what? What's that? <laughs> like, that was sort of just dropped out of nowhere, right? So, so Jacob st sent, sent his, his family and his extended family and his hired hands and his servants and his slaves and his flock, and they all cross here at the floor of the low shower part of the river, uh, but for some reason, he doesn't. Uh, he just he stays on the other side to spend a night alone. And then, also randomly, it seems, some dude comes along and picks a fight with him. And they fight all night long. And that's weird. And so, some have asked, we might ask, scholars have asked for a very long time, was that real or was it a dream? Well, there does seem to be some real consequences. We will see that as we go along. What is that Jacob is left with a wound, a limp. Uh, and so some have pointed to that and say it said, like, well, Jacob wouldn't have come out physically injured from an imaginary fight or a uh, dream. Although others have said it could be psychosomatic. But again, for now, we're going down a different road. So let's get back on track at verse 25. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him in the hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint. As he wrestled with it. And um, okay, so that's kind of cheating, right? <laughs> Apparently, uh, the man, uh, as we'll hear, represents um, God or an angel. Uh, there are multiple interpretations here. Um, cannot get the upper hand on Jacob, and so he whacks him in the hip. Apparently, there was no referee, you know, like, all right, boys, here are the rules. No biting, no scratching, no hair, hair pulling, no, uh, you know, smacking somebody in the hip till it goes out of joint. Because that's what happens. Verse 26. Then he, the man, said, let me go for the, for the day is breaking. Let me go for the day is breaking. What does that have to do with anything? Well, there are lots of theories out there, and some of them are um, have very little biblical grounding. One of them to which I give no credence, is something like this. The man was some sort of divine being that had to depart before sunrise because uh, was a creature of the darkness and not of the light, making him out to be something like, I don't know, a vampire that has to escape before sunrise. And there's no reason to believe that at all. Not biblically or otherwise. But the man does say, let me go for the day is breaking. So what does that mean if it's not... You know, some sort of strange weirdness like that. Well, here's a couple of more practical possibilities. The man may be saying something like, look, 
Jacob, we've been at this all night. And I have even put your hip out of joint. And now there is no way that you can win. So let go. Let go of me. Let go of this fight. Uh, enough already. Another possibility, and maybe connected, is something like this. Jacob, it's almost morning. And you will be needing to cross the river and catch up with your family. So can we just say enough is enough and you let me go? But Jacob will not, as we will read in continuing verse 26. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Because if we, as we have seen from previous stories, Jacob is big on getting his blessing. Verse 27, so he, the man, said to Jacob, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, Yaakov, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans, and you have prevailed. Hold on, and that will make more sense. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. And he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And again, that's a little bit of a huh moment, right? Like, huh? What, what, what does that mean? I mean, uh, is, he, is the man asking Jacob, the other wrestler asking Jacob, Jacob, why do you even need to know my name? Well, I think it's really more of a statement um, along this line. Jacob, take a moment. I have wrestled with you all night, and I have renamed you. I have renamed you wrestles with God. God, do you really have to ask who I am? Isn't it clear by now? This is the face of God, the representative of God representation of God, or as the prophet Hosea will uh, say in his uh, writings, the angel or messenger of God. Verse 30, uh, oh, for into verse 29, and there he blessed him. So Jacob, verse 30, called the place Panael, uh, Hebrew pen means face, saying, for I have seen the God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. Panael, the face of God. Verse 31, the sun rose up, upon him as he passed Peniel limping because of his hip. There's a Hebrew word play here. The, the limping of Jacob is a Yoakab, which is a play on both his name, Yoakab, Jacob, and the name of the river, the Yabok. Uh, we find these in Hebrew a lot, um, these word plays, these puns. Um, but some bigger takeaways, as the Arthur uh, author points out, uh, the other ref wrestler here is referred to as a man, but then by Jacob is referred to as God, and in Hosea, again, the angel. So this is why it fits in to our lesson. God will give Jacob a new name, a nickname, the name, as we said, of Israel or Israel. El, again, meaning God, as in Bethel, uh, house of God. In this case, Israel, Isra means to strive or to contend with or to wrestle with. So the name Israel means wrestles or strives with God. In the end of all of this in our magazine, uh, page 39, column uh, uh, two, are some questions, including this one I think is a good one to, to think about. Question eight. Uh, do you have any examples of physical struggles or injuries through which you felt you have received a message from God? Uh, Jacob comes away with this encounter with a messenger from God with a, an injured hip and a limp. Um, are there experiences that you've had uh, that have, uh, through which a, a physical injury or struggle uh, has been a way through which God has, has delivered a message to you? And, and I would say, to give you an example, maybe to give you a place to go in your own conversations, for me, um, my greatest example is my heart surgery and my, my scar, which I still bear and always will, a reminder, a physical reminder uh, of my uh, fragility, uh, of uh, how precious life is, how you never know, uh, and how grateful I am uh, to have life uh, when I was so close to not. So uh, that would be an example for me. All right, we're on to our next story and our next text. This is the story of Moses and the burning bush. It's in Exodus chapter 3, it's verses 1 to 4. Exodus 3, verses 1 to 4. Here we go. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. 
Now, um, it's confusing because Mount Oreb is also known in the Bible as Mount Sinai. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about that. Not everybody agrees. The greatest number of Bible scholars and biblical uh, geography experts and archaeologists most agree that there's one mountain with two names, Oreb and Sinai. Some think that these are two different mountains. It's not really theologically that important, but we're Bible, stu or Bible um, scholars, students, we're studying God's word, so let's dig into it just a little bit, uh, because this is an important place, right? Moses will return here. He's encountering God here through the burning bush, uh, through the angel uh, in the burning bush, which turns him around, turns him aside, turns him towards God. He will uh, uh, travel up this mountain to encounter God many other times. He will receive the Ten Commandments from God on this same mountain. So um, why the two names? Well, some suggest that Horeb and Sinai are two peaks or two points on the same mountain. Or they refer to two different sides of the mountain, the east and the west. Uh, Oreb, uh, Horeb uh, in Hebrew means uh, heat or burning and uh, might refer to the sun. Or Sinai is a uh, root from sin, not that we think of it that way, uh, in this case, in reference to the moon. So uh, maybe it is a reference to the mountain whose face uh, turns to the sun and to the moon. Um, so there you go, a little fun biblical geography. Um, we're returning now to our regularly scheduled programming, verse 2. There the angel of the Lord, a reminder from last month's Bible study, uh, in Hebrew in the Old Testament, when we hear uh, read angel, it is the word malak, which means literally a messenger. So the messenger of Yahweh appeared to Moses in a flame of fire. Now that's really good Hebrew redundancy. We run into that all the time. Uh, in in um, Hebrew scripture, the Old Testament, uh, this kind of um, redundancy of, of language, a flame of fire. Sometimes this gets translated in English as a flaming fire or a tongue of fire or a, a lap of fire. The point is, the bush was on fire. Uh, he appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the bush and he looked and lo, uh, that's dropped from our translation, but it's there in the Hebrew, Lo and behold, the bush was blazing, but it was not consumed. Verse 3, Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. And verse 4, When the Lord Yahweh saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, Here I am. So literally this is a story of an angel, this time appearing in a bush of fire, but not consumed turning someone aside. And in page on page 40, column 1, verse 9, uh, we have a related question. And uh, we're asked to think about if there's uh, been a, a feat of nature or a, a natural experience or something in creation that has turned us aside, been a message for, for us. Um, perhaps it's fearsome thunderstorm, or maybe a beautiful sunset. Uh, have a conversation in your circles if you're, if you're gathering uh, through Zoom or other means. Uh, has, has God ever used creation uh, to be that messenger, uh, to be the message for you? Another question, not in our study, that I, I would offer for you to consider is, how has God gotten your attention? God got Moses' attention uh, through... Uh, a burning bush that was not consumed. Or we might say, how has God attuned our attention to a message that God wants us to have? Next comes an optional story, which we are going to skip because we, as you can see, this is already a lot and we still have more to go. It's a story of Balaam. Although I have to say, I hate skipping over this story because I have to fight, fight the temptation uh, to tell the story so I can use one of my favorite phrases is and that is, if we do not pay attention, we might end up like Balaam, because God eventually had to speak to Balaam through his donkey. But we move on. To the three encounters, Joseph, the husband of Mary, and the earthly father, um, stepfather, if you will, of Jesus, had with uh, angels in visions or in dreams. These are from, all from the Gospel of Matthew. The first is chapter 1. 
And this is uh, the angel coming to reassure Joseph that he should marry Mary, uh, though she was pregnant and he had not known her. So this is verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, she had become pregnant before marriage, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, she will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. Now I've shared this in the past, but as a recap, uh, what's going on there with this naming? Well, Jesus is uh, an Anglicanized, an English translation out of the Greek from uh, the Aramaic, Yeshua, or the Hebrew, Yahshua, uh, for which the English equivalent is Joshua. And all of these, Jesus, Yeshua, Yoshua, Yoshua, Joshua, um, and other related names, um, including the Spanish Jesus, are all um, mean the same thing. Uh, linked back to the original Hebrew uh, of Joshua, Yahshua, uh, and they mean, literally, God saves. So the angel says to uh, Joseph, you will name this son Yeshua, God saves, because he will save his people from his sins. Literally, the name Jesus means, Yahshua, li literally means God or, or Yahweh saves. So there you are. Verse 24. When Joseph awoke from his dream, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her, Mary, as his wife. But he had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son. And he named him Jesus. So the next angelic encounter, Matthew 2, 13 to 15, explains to us how or why uh, Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus become refugees, fleeing a tyrannical dictator. Herod, uh, King Herod, this is Herod the first. Um, this is the story of, of the angel directing or, or turning aside the Holy Family from Israel to Egypt. Now after they, that is, after the Magi, after the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and said in a dream, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This is to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. That is a uh, quote from uh, Hosea, chapter 11, verse 1. So uh, there's this warning message. Turn aside from Israel, run away from Herod, and um, flee to Egypt. And then the third and final angelic encounter, the bookend of this, is the return announcement. This is also in the second chapter of Matthew, verses 19 to 21. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. Now, when did all this take place and how old was Jesus? Some people have wondered. So let's, what can we figure out? Well, we can very, um, not very, quite accurately, quite uh, comfortably uh, date the death of King Herod I, uh, also known in history books as Herod the Great. A um, misnomer of great means uh, man of morals, you know, responsible for the slaughter of the innocents. Um, and many other tyrannical acts, but great in the sense that he um, ruled a long time, he built a lot of stuff, um, he uh, successfully held uh, things together during this time of occupation. Uh, he died uh, in um, March or April of uh, the year 4 BCE, which aligns basically to year 1 AD, depending on how you're counting things, right? So Jesus was uh, one year old, 
Well, more or less. Because while we have historical documentation that tells us when Herod died, we don't have historical documentation that tells us exactly when Jesus was born. In spite of these datings, which, as you probably are aware, uh, we now know based on the AD, uh, BC AD delineations that zero isn't placed in the right place. Um, and um, heaven forbid that I ruin Christmas for you, but December 25th, we don't have a birth certificate that that's the birthday of Jesus. Um, but that's a horse of a different color and a whole can of worms and probably a lot of other animal-based expressions. Uh, and not the main point. What is the main point? The main point is that God sends again a messenger, an angel, to Joseph. This is a third time. And uh, to give him the all-clear message that uh, it is clear and safe for a return to Israel, to the region of Galilee, and to the town of Nazareth where Jesus will be brought up, having had a, a, a refugee's experience as a baby. So, those are the texts before us. What are some of the takeaways from this uh, second part of this four-part study? Well, for me, God uses angelic encounters in various forms to guide or steer or turn aside people, sometimes to uh, turn them away from something or someone dangerous, sometimes, as in the Garden of Eden story, because they have become a danger to something. Uh, sometimes it is to turn people toward things that are holy, including God's holy calling for their lives. Another takeaway is that God's messages are sometimes very clear, just like to, to Joseph. Go to Egypt. Come back to Israel. And sometimes less so, as in the examples of the life of Jacob and his angelic encounters. And third, given the breadth of the biblical examples uh, of angelic encounters, we should remain open to the possibility, at least, that God sends messages and messengers to people today probably in all kinds of various forms. And so what about you? And what about your circles? What are your takeaways? How do you um, encounter God's messages and uh, God's messengers? I'd be very interested in how your discussions or your individual contemplations go. But for now, uh, that's our study for this month. So thanks for spending this time with me and uh, in God's word. And blessings to those of you who will be leading your circles or parts of circles together in some form or another in this time. If this is your study, thanks for being my circle this month. Until next month, God bless and keep you. So long.